So just to review the other style of animation we went over first so we can see the comparison. Um, I have an object here and it is a movie clip so both kinds of animation, both kinds of tweens, whether it's classic or motion, they need to be movie clips um, which you would accomplish by saying right click convert to symbol and then you would name it and say okay. Um, but I, when we did the classic tween what we had to do is we set everything up properly um, and then we would come out somewhere on the timeline, right click, insert keyframe, make a change to that keyframe, right? So keyframe A is different than keyframe B. And then we would say create classic tween and it does the in-betweens for us, right? So you got to set up your keyframes first and then set up the tween. Um, and then after that, whether you're adding a keyframe or in the middle or adding one afterwards, it's still when you add a keyframe, then the tweens follow. Um, but the other kind of tween we need to go over is a motion tween, and this works very differently. So first off, this is a movie clip. It's actually from your book. It's a character that's got you know like a bunch of stuff on it, um, and we've got just sitting here in a uh, timeline. I'm actually going to right click insert frame, not a keyframe, a frame, um, because I want there to be more space. Uh, I just want more time to work with. And what we're going to do is instead of setting up keyframes, we're actually going to turn on the tween now because this has an auto key feature. In other words, when we make a change, it's automatically going to place a key. This is both good and bad. So if I right click anywhere in here and I say create motion tween, you can see that we get this blue timeline. And the way this works is you simply go to whatever point in the timeline you want like the second piece of the animation to be. And if I drag this out this way, you can see it's got a motion path. It's going to automatically key, it's going to automatically tween it. And if I go back to that keyframe and I change where I want it to go, it's going to change how it tweens. It's going to update it automatically. If I go to the end here, put this over here, you can see it automatically goes between there. Um, so you can see it's a little bit different. We don't have to manually place any keyframes, sort of. Um, so that's one key difference though is that it's automatically placing these keys. The thing is though it's automatically placing these keys um, on the thing that got changed which in this case is the location, right? The translation, where it is on the screen. For this example if I was to shrink this in the middle on this keyframe it's still its main size there, it shrinks down, and then it's its main size here because when we made these keyframes, it established this location, this scale, this rotation, this alpha, this everything. For this one, that's not the case. If I go to this middle keyframe and I shrink this down, this one, because it's the first keyframe it remembered, the first key is like special. So it shrinks down there, but see how it's still shrunk over here? So we have to keep track of which attributes, that's the fancy word for ideas or things or um, uh, qualities in a particular item. Um, but we have to remember which of these we've put keys on for what. And so for example, if I want this to scale down, but then come back to where it is, I need to go to the end click on that key, right click, insert keyframe, and you'll see there's now all these options. And I can say insert keyframe scale. And now I can go to this one and shrink it down. It's auto keying the scale because I'm changing it, but it didn't auto, it doesn't auto key no to go back to this one. So I had to go there and set a key at the last keyframe to say, okay, like have the scale go back to there before I told this to get um, smaller. So you got to keep track of these things. And the same as you can see for uh, it's there's position, scale, skew, rotation, and if applicable it would be colors and filters. So you can key color effect, that would be under color, and you can key what's going on in the filter, but you have to set it up to do that 
otherwise it, it doesn't. Now, why is this um, even a good idea? Why is this considered a feature and not a bug? Well, let me revert back to, okay. I'm trying to make sure I'm back to where I was. Um, we're gonna go back on this one too. Okay. So, the strength of this is that sometimes you don't want everything to be keyed. So for example, if I if I need this to move to here and then to here, so I need three different keyframes for the position. But what if I wanted to scale down across the whole animation? If I shrink this here, it's gonna be at the right size here, and so now I'll have to come here and I'll have to shrink it down and like guess and hope I'm shrinking it down evenly which the answer to whether it's even will change if I draw this out and now it's gonna take forever to shrink the last bit and so because this is uneven I have to have it less shrunk here um, and you can see how that would get very difficult very quickly with the motion tween I go to the last key here if I shrink this down it's going to scale across the whole animation because this key only represents position it doesn't represent scale unless I tell it to so it's this, if for those of you who code this will sound very very familiar um, it does not make any assumptions this this version makes no assumptions which means you have to have more control over what you're doing but more control over what you're doing means more control and more options um, more finesse right um, another thing we can do with this, and this is the key part. So those were kind of the um, minor hiccups that you might get with something like this. But the, the major part is the motion path, which is this path right here. Now you'll remember, I'm going to go into my uh, symbol for a second. You remember way back in ye olde days of September, um, when we were learning about these shapes, we learned that if you just click over a line you can actually bend it right so if you don't don't select it first but if you don't already have it selected whoop, you can just kinda hover over a line till you see that little line symbol and then click it and bend it and you, you can do all sorts of um, reshaping of these vector lines well your motion path here is the exact same thing. It is a vector line. There's an anchor point, an anchor point, an anchor point, and the line is drawn between them, which means you can hover over it until you see the line and bend it. Which means now, instead of this really straight animation where it's just bang, bang, um, you can have curved lines. I'm going to unscale this because <laughs> we can't see it. Um, now don't mind the fact that it's not facing where it has to go we're gonna fix that in a minute but the idea that you can um, curve the line is huge because now you can have stuff orbiting other things and stuff running around in circles and basically you can have stuff that takes this path to get somewhere right I could draw that out with between um, not like that with a brush, but you can you can you can manipulate oh, there we go. this curve in exactly the same fashion. I can grab my sub selection tool and start to draw this path. And as I pull these handles, it moves the path around the exact same way it would move a shape around, right? So you remember I, I, I said you guys should really learn these drawing tools and learn how to reshape things and I wasn't just saying that to be mean I was saying that because it's a very very true thing um, that you're going to use these tools going forward. Now one thing you'll notice is that there's a lot of dots over here and not very many dots over here. That's a representation of how many frames there are. So there's a lot of frames here and then not very many here and that's why the speed will change substantially as it goes so it's like slow it's slow and then away picks up speed if you want to change this is exactly the same as with the um, other frames I click on this key once and let go and then I click and drag it again 
and I'm redistributing the motion across time because I'm saying you got to get to this key earlier and so now you do. All right. So you can change this path however you want. I can always add more frames. Right click insert frame. Now I've got more time. Now manipulating the timeline does get a little bit different eventually though. We've seen before in here, like if we want this to move back to the beginning, I can click on a frame, right click, copy frame, come out over here, right click, paste frame, and if I create a classic tween, it goes from the start down to here, down to the end, and then back to the beginning. And this frame matches this one because I copied and pasted it. Well, in this it's slightly different. It's the same idea. I can take everything that's going on over here and transpose it to over here. The thing is it's not called copy frame. If I try to copy the frame, I will break it. Um, I can. I can go here and then I say paste frame and it does that and it's like it, it's this whole new tween. It gets very confused. Um, basically what's happening is I'm using a wrong tool and it's, it's, it's breaking. So what I need to do instead is right click copy properties. So frames has to do with classic tween and all these properties has to do with uh, motion tween. And then I go to the end, right click, paste frame. I Nope. Oh my goodness. Right click, paste property. There we go. And now you can see it comes about like this and then like this and then it flies backwards. Now it's making an approximation of what it thinks I want it to do. It's wrong. You can see it kind of like curve this around oddly. So it's just like when you make a shape and you close off the shape and it gets really confused as to what's going on. Um, also, you can see this is coming into a point. There's no handle. Um, there's a handle for this side, but not for this side. If I want to draw that out, I hold down Alt and then I click and drag over the edge, just like curving a line in a shape. And also, if I hold down Alt, I can bend one of these handles differently than the other. All right, so all of the same hotkeys that you had with drawing shapes apply here as well. All the same stuff. Um, but now it's going to move the way I want it to. Now, <coughs> I said before that um, don't worry about the fact that it's not facing where it needs to go. We're, we can fix that. All right, step one is to take this and point it in the general direction of the path. Step two is to look at the properties for this motion path. This motion path itself has properties over here, just like the movie clip has properties, it has color effect and filter and everything. This motion path has properties. And one of them, which you should only select when you're on the first frame, because that's when you set your orientation, this is orient to path. When I do that, it follows the path. Now it flips around a little bit there because of course that's a very hard turn so it's not the solution to everything. You will also notice this a keyframe on every frame. What's happening here is that the program cannot deal with this idea of orienting this rotation on every frame at first. It has to bake it in and it bakes it in by putting a keyframe on every frame. Now all I have to do is turn off orient to path and I can edit my frames, right? I can edit this, I can shrink things down, um, and then just turn orient to path back on. The only more thing you have to remember is be at the beginning where you oriented the ship in the first place. Because if you orient it to path while it's facing this way, oh, that's a new thing. I'm very happy about this. It's paying attention to the first frame instead of the frame you're on. That's lovely. All right, your guys' lives are a little bit easier <laughs> because it's going to listen. Um, let's see. Also, um, you'll see that whenever I'm hovering kind of toward close to the edge and I'm trying to like put a frame on the end, I get these two arrows. Those are for shrinking down your tween. It does not get rid of the last few frames. It takes the whole animation and it squashes or stretches it in time. And so you can see it scaled all these keys appropriately or um, what's the word? proportionally would be the better word. So 
as you're drawing with this, you can decide, oh, I need this to take up less time, hover over the edge, you see the two arrows, you can move this. Make sure you're not grabbing those two arrows accidentally, because when you click there, you click the whole timeline, and that can make it difficult to add a single keyframe somewhere. All right. Um, also something to be aware of, you cannot add one type of tween, or um, you can't combine types of tweens on a layer. I can't say for this section, oh, I want it to be a motion tween. It does this. <laughs> it says, nope. And it puts it on a new layer, and you can see these two layers are very different. You'll notice that the masks we went over um, the same week also look different. When we get to the bone tool, that will look different. It's basically telling you these are two very different ideas. They do not mix and match. They do not play well together. So you have to be aware of that. Um, one other thing that happens procedurally on this timeline, uh, besides oriented path, is rotation. So unlike this kind of tween where you can specify very specifically rotate this much, um, and it'll gently rotate that much. Um, this is a little different. It's going to rotate the same amount across the whole animation. So, for example, if I click on this and I say rotate five times, it will rotate five times across the whole animation. That's one place where it doesn't lend us to a lot of control. So what if you want this to do two different things? Um, where it rotates and then does not rotate. Um, we have to do a bit of a trick. So what we can do is, let's say we want this to fly all around here and orient to path, and we want it to do that and then start spinning wildly. Um, I'm actually going to right click on that and I'm going to clear keyframe all. I don't want it going back there. There we go. Perfect. Um, so how do we do this? Well, we can trick it. So um, in animation, or in the computer, when we copy and paste something and it's identical, you can't tell the difference when you're watching. So if I click on this, I'm going to take this, this ship and I say copy. And I put a keyframe directly in the same exact spot. Oops. I'm going to put the keyframe in that spot, but I'm realizing if I want this to orient to path, I need to take that position. So I needed to tell it to orient to path, and now I can copy it because you need to make sure everything is all set, right? But I copy it and I paste it. We can't right click um, to paste it, which is unfortunate. We have to go to edit, paste in place because I needed to be very specifically in the same place as the other layer. But now what I can do is I can remove these extra frames so that we get this path here and then I can say create motion tween here and then have it spin three times. And what's going to happen is it's going to move, it's going to move, it's going to move, it's going to get there and uh, it looks better if I rotate it the other way. You can tell it to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. There we go. So it's going to follow the path and then start rotating. And to watch it, if we test this movie, as we should always be doing because these things will play better, you can't tell where it's switching from one thing to the other. This is a tried and true animation technique where you just switch models, you switch layers, you switch ideas, you switch whatever, and you can't tell that there's a switch. Um, it's a cheat, but it's a, it's a totally acceptable one. So you may have to do that a lot where you have to plan out your animation first and know in this section it's spinning, in this section it's moving in a line, in this section it's fading in and out, and you'll need to plan that accordingly. Now it can get tricky because if I go to orient to path, uh, turn this off for a second, and I decide, well actually I want this to be down here, then obviously this, whoops, let me lock the one I don't want to change. There we go. And I move this down here and it changes the motion path. This one no longer matches. So I would have to recopy this, put it in the right spot. It, it's a little bit tricky. 
Um, so you might have two things you're paying attention to in terms of position, stuff like that. Um, but that's necessary and it's a small price to pay for everything else working out so seamlessly. So keep in mind you, you will have to pay a little bit more attention. But generally speaking, this type of tweening has a lot of power to it. Um, it's a lot of specifics. It's kind of like switching from an iPhone to an Android. You have more options, but you're more likely to break it. Um, keep in mind also that all of the same rules apply that applied for tweening in terms of prep, right? So you have to make sure it is a movie clip before you add anything else. And you should also get in the habit, if I revert this back, of making sure that this anchor point is exactly where you want it to be. I probably don't want this rotating around the back end of its rocket booster. If I want it rotating, it probably needs to like rotate from here, something more useful, something that's center mass. Um, you have to do all this prep work before you turn on the tween, before you set any keyframes. It's the same as with this one. If you already have all these keyframes and these tweens in, you can't change the anchor point. You will mess up what you're doing. If I if I change the anchor point here on this one, it's gonna rotate all. Well, it's kind of hard. Yeah, you can see it's like blinking there because it's it's not connecting anymore. It's a, the anchor point has moved, um, and it kind of doesn't know what to do with that. So making sure that you have turned it into a movie clip, that you've changed the anchor point to where you need it, that you've basically prepped everything exactly how you want it before you add any keyframes. Or worst case scenario, you put a couple keyframes in, you test it, you get rid of them, and you change it again. Also, if you ever see, let me make a new layer real quick. There we go. This following error message. The selected item cannot be tween. You must convert this to a symbol. Do you want to convert and create a tween? No. Hit cancel. If you do it that way, if you let the computer do it for you, it does it in a bad way. Um, Especially if you're doing classic tweets. Whoops, I didn't undo front. Yeah, it makes this, and it makes it very confusing, and it makes it very, very difficult to put together, um, because you will end up with two things in the library that aren't that are supposed to be the same but aren't, and it's also just it's bad habit. So if we see all sorts of unnamed symbols and unnamed tweens and graphics in here, I'll know that that's what you're doing, and that's being very at best very sloppy. And if you forget to transform everything into a symbol, um, and you you know get further along, and I'm like, oh well, you're gonna have to do a lot of work to fix this. That's on you. So make sure you are always converting everything to a symbol, preferably a movie clip. Um, but it does have to be a symbol. But if you ever see that error, just hit cancel. Ask me a question, but like, don't continue. Don't let the computer do this because it, it will mess. It will create significantly extra work for you. So I'll always keep everything prepared and neat and orderly.